it'll give you average human size in relation to an impala. But I can give you more than that. Their shoulder height is usually just under a meter, and their weight is often around 50 kilograms, so about a, just over 100 pounds. So I'm not sure what kind of dog fits into that category. A dog or an animal that we can relate to on, on a kind of more regular basis is going to be tricky because they've got quite long legs, longer legs than a dog, um, but not as heavy as a, as a dog that, that, that size. So it's not easy to give an easy animal to relate to, but like I said, the, the average shoulder height of around 90 centimeters to a meter will be able to give you a good idea of how big that animal is. Well, we're going to continue seeing what we can find, and I think you should go across to James for an update on how he's coming along. Right, well, we are driving towards Biffleshook Dam. Now, oh, I've still got my glasses on. Sorry about that. That apparently is that's very rude of me. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just that uh, my eyes, of course, uh, are being uh, crisply burnt, crisply cooked by the sun this afternoon. Um, we're going to go to Biffleshook Dam. Uh, of course, there's no water there, although there was some in the puddles of the elephant's feet the other day. And so we'll go and see what's there. And then we probably are going to check a little... Um, excuse me. We're probably going to check uh, where Karula last had a kill. Andrew told me that um, when there was a diker in the kill there, a diker in the kill, a diker in the tree that Karula left before she'd finished. And uh, Scott then guessed that perhaps something was up and she might be going to give birth. But let's go and see if anything else has taken that out of the tree. And perhaps Mvula will have come and uh, snacked on the last of his consort's food. Now, the question, of course, remains as to who is the father of these young cubs. And interestingly, she has mated, of course, with, and she's mated with um, Tingana, she's mated with Mvula, she's mated with Anderson, so who knows? And Ginny, I think you asked the question as to who the father is. There is absolutely no way of telling short of doing a DNA test. And of course, we will try and do that. You can do that from the scat, from the dung. Um, and we've got now, we've got DNA profiles for all the males of the area. We've got DNA profiles for Karula. And so as soon as these little ones start um, putting dung in a place where it's accessible, we'll go and get hold of someone. We'll do a DNA profile on them. And that should give us an indication there's an impala running away into the deep shade. Um, that should give us an indication as to who the father is. Um, I've no doubt that there will be lots and lots of guesses as to who they, the most likely candidate is, and people will be able to see familiarities in the, diff in the two cubs, if there are two, I'm just guessing that there are probably two. Um, <clears throat> they'll be able to see familiarities with the, fa the different males in the, in the area, but I assure you, oh, there goes a die cap that you will, there is no way to tell unless uh, a DNA test is done. And what is interesting to me is that she has mated with all three of them, and um, Tingana largely, I mean, Tingana is the most likely candidate as the father because he's been, he mated with Karula, I think three or four times. And so he's the most likely candidate. Uh, but who knows, it might be Mvula, it might be Anderson. And the reason she will mate with all those males is so that all of them think that they have produced her offspring, which just reduces the chances of them killing the cubs. Because of course, 80% of cub mortality is caused by male leopards. Infanticide, a great strangeness in the mammal class very common amongst just about all the families of mammals. You can see, I'm just, you know, I know we, we, we had a bit of a break in the drought and there was grass went a bit green, but it's already going brown again. The trees, leaves are all closed up. They're hiding from the sun. The shade is kind of wispy. There's no deep, beautiful shade um, that we often get at this time of the year. And it's just got that really hot kind of dry feeling. No clouds building on the horizon, which means that it's just gonna get brighter and brighter until the sun eventually does set. 
And I must confess, I've never experienced a low-filled summer like this one. This has been the hottest, brightest, and driest summer that I've experienced in 10 years out here. Hello, Darlene in New Hampshire. A very lovely question from you about orchids. Of course, one of my favorite flowers out here, the leopard orchid, which you know about. Um, and you want to know if there are any other kinds of orchids out here. Darlene, um, I, there aren't any that I know of. I just don't think it's wet enough. Certainly in South Africa, plenty down in Natal in the sand forest, you'll find, um, if it's not hundreds, it's certainly almost a hundred species of orchid and uh, very difficult to identify little ones. They're not those sort of amazing things that you buy in the shops these days that they grow in pots, um, you know, the huge blooms, tiny little flowers, often just a few millimeters across, fractions of an inch uh, in length and size. And I know one of the guys I used to work with became something of a leopard, of an orchid expert. Um, he also went slightly mad, so that might be a, might have something to do with it. But no other orchids that I know of in this particular area, no. Bee eaters calling above us. I'll just try and find some shade to stop in when we look at this dam. There we go. Well, I'm in the shade. Andrew, are you in the shade? Oh, look, 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 look. There's a water buck. Hello, water buck. Now, that water buck, everybody. Well, let's just watch him first before I start yakking and making myself look like a fool. What I suspect that waterbuck cow is doing is now enjoying that greenery. And the reason the greenery, of course, has survived as long as it has is because that mud there is very tricky to get in and amongst. Andrew and I have first-hand experience of that. Um, but still, I mean, Andrew, we went into Christmas Day, which was now phew, more than a month ago. It's actually sort of five or six weeks ago. And still there's mud underneath there, which makes the going very treacherous indeed. And that's why that greenery persists, despite the lack of greenery every, everywhere else. I think there was an elephant trying to eat some the other day. The elephants won't struggle too much, but the antelope will really kind of cut themselves and slice their legs as they try and walk amongst that clay, infused as it is with their fish bones, sharp, nasty, razorish fish bones. So that's a water buck. And for those of you who don't know, they're pretty common around here, more common than anywhere else I've worked before. And will be looking, I mean, they're called waterbuck because they're supposedly r rush to water when threatened by predators. Yes, they do, but so do, so do many other animals. She's quite beautiful, isn't she? Hello, Brandon, you're in Arkansas. You're aged just six years old. Uh, I was aged six once, if you can believe it. I know it must seem absolutely impossible that somebody of my advanced years could possibly have ever been six. And you say that your parents also would like to see an elephant. Well, Brandon, we will do our best to find your parents an elephant, but I hope also that you want to see an elephant. Uh, we might be lucky and we may well see an elephant today. It's a nice hot day. And so it's quite possible that the elephants will come down to drink at some stage during the course of this drive. I will tell you, of course, that waterbuck have got a heart-shaped nose. Uh, yes, I suppose they do. Look at that, the black, I suppose the black part of the nose is very heart-shaped. And she's trying to smell what we want, you see, she can see us. She can smell sunscreen, which is, of course, an unfamiliar smell to her and the wind's blowing from us to her, and that's why I suspect if we were sitting the other side of the dam there, that she'd probably get on with eating. But because she can smell us, she's just a little bit more wary. 
I'm very glad I don't have to wear a coat quite that thick when the temperature is like it is now. There we go. <laughs> Lovely red in her eyes there. You can see how difficult it is for her to walk. Yeah, look at that. Now that will hurt. It will hurt her feet, it'll cut, it'll certainly slice into her legs. Very graceful. And she's in pretty good nick, you know. She's not in bad condition. The, the drought has obviously not taken too much toll on her. That's another little alarm call she's given because she can smell us. Her coat is shiny. Her hips aren't sticking out. So she's doing pretty well. I'm sure lots of the animals would have grazed and uh, really extensively in the last few days after that little bit of rain we had and the green flush that lasted for about three or four days. Talk on the, uh, on the weather forecast is that we should be getting rain, um, probably, if not tomorrow, the next day. But tomorrow, of course, it will have moved to Friday. And by the weekend, it probably will have just dissipated entirely. There we go. Let's try and see if there she's going to try and walk back in there. You can see she's sinking. That's because there is still mud there. And she'll be nervous that, to go in there because she knows she can't move very quickly if she does get stuck in there. And she's not convinced that we aren't going to try and eat her. I don't think we will, though, will we, Andrew? No, probably not. There's a nice cooling breeze blowing now. And I, I believe that Scott was chatting to you about the sizes of the different antelope that we get out here, and he was talking about an impala, where a big one weighs probably between 60 and 70 kilograms, uh, which, if you multiply it by 2.2, gives you roughly between 160 and 180 pounds. Now, this water buck is probably the same size as a kudu. So a big male will weigh in the region of, in the vicinity of 100 or 270 kilograms. I'm just going to check that on my little bird, on my little mammal app, which is quite a useful thing. And so roughly kudu-sized and kudu-mast. There we go. Come on, eat something. You can see how nervous they are all the time when they go down to water any kind of... Um, the herbivore will be extremely nervous when they go down to water or into an area where they know they can't move very, very fast. Oh, look, she's got water. Look at that. That's in from, that's, she's drinking straight out of an elephant's uh, footprint. I'll, I'll, we'll go down there and have a look when she's moved off. That's interesting. And that won't be delicious water. But, as I've said many times, of course, these animals don't have to worry too much about, um, about the bacteria and stuff in the water. I mean, were you and I to uh, drink that water, we would certainly spend quite a lot of time in the lavatory for an extended period. But the animals out here can cope with that sort of thing. So, yes, I was absolutely correct. Well, that's, a, that's a complete relief. The males weigh 198 to 262 kilos, which is 437 to 578 pounds. So this female, about 280 or so kilograms, roughly 400 pounds. She's smelling something on the wind there. Maybe Mvula stalking towards us slowly. Interesting question from Mr. Moustache, who's now in Iceland. Mr. Moustache, I'm pretty sure that you didn't begin 
um, your safari live days in Iceland. Uh, but uh, not, Iceland sounds like quite a nice option as we sit here, this, the heat here, and you want to know about whether or not animals here are susceptible to heat-related illnesses. Um, no, I don't think they are. I think they're, they're actually really good at losing heat uh, most of the time. And you know, I know I, we complain a lot about the heat, or we, we make mention a lot about the heat. Um, it's you know, it's not desert temperatures here most of the time. It has been, well, I mean, we've certainly had them um, this year, but most of the time the animals will, um, they will avoid the open sun a lot of the time, they'll go into the shade. I suppose, yes, they could perhaps suffer from heat exhaustion um, if it got really hot and there wasn't sufficient shade. But no, they're pretty good at getting rid of the heat and avoiding the hottest part of the day. And I was just saying to Andrew, I'm feeling the heat today, and I'm not. I think it's probably because you know when we, uh, when we're back at camp, we're in in our in our rooms, um, and I was doing some sort of some uh, tapping away on a computer earlier today, and I think you know when the absence of deep shade and a nice breeze, I think these our rooms do get very hot indeed, and human beings are supposed to be really good at getting rid of heat. That's why we don't have any hair on our bodies. It's why we stand upright. One of the major reasons we stand upright. Right, I think this water buck has given us all it's going to. Right, and Annie, you say that waterbuck remind you of reindeer in shape and size. Um, I've never, I actually have actually seen a reindeer. Um, they've got some on the golf course where I, I sometimes play in the Eastern Cape. Um, they do, they're very similar size, you're absolutely correct. What I'm gonna do is make my way around to where that kudu had, at least kudu, where that reindeer was drinking. And um, we'll head across to Scott while I do that, and I will see you at the water. Surprised to hear that the waterbuck actually found anything to drink at the Buffalo's Oak Waterhole. And happy to hear that you got a good sighting of it with James. We haven't been seeing too much, however, there are some zebra tracks moving down this road, so maybe we'll bump into some zebra. There were some elephant tracks heading up the road. Oh, well, there we go. There's an animal that just popped up right in front of us. Beast. Um, I'm guessing it's not alone, it could well be a part of a herd. Well, he's a big bull, so who knows, maybe he's semi-retired and living life alone. Well, I think I may have chosen an inopportune moment to freewheel. because, as you can see, there's a lot of vegetation between us and it. I'm told there was a lot of safari goers on the Sunrise Safari who were wondering, let me just try and reposition, wondering where the herds of wildebeest have gone. And they're around, I think. They might actually just be right here with their young calves. A lot of you have been wanting to get an update on those calves. Interestingly enough, they spend almost every night, oh wow, look at this. Awesome. Take some screenshots. This is incredible and typical behavior from a big bull. And you may have seen some little pellets falling between those back legs of his. He just went to the toilet after scraping his hooves in the ground there. And it's not uncommon for them to also urinate after performing that little maneuver. I just don't want to start the vehicle because we are quite close to him. But good confirming behavior of what would be the dominant bull of the herd. And then just behind him to the right, I don't know if Brian's got the right angle. I don't think he does. He's a bit higher than where I am, but just off to the right, the rest of the herd seems to be sitting in the shadows. But no, Brian's got a wall of thick green vegetation in the way there. So let's move forward and see if we can't get another gap. I 
as I was saying, interestingly, every night the quarantine clearings, the clearings close to our camp, looks like a city when you drive past with all the eyes full of animals. Of which a lot of the time the wildebeest are there. But they only arrive there late in the evening. Maybe we'll try and camp out there later on this evening. There's a little gap where we might just be able to see one calf lying down there next to its mom. Yep, there we go. Little horns protruding already, just a few months old. But this is the best view we are going to get. If any of you jo are joining for the first time, which I'm sure there are some of you, please let us know. And importantly, I would just like to let you know that we only off-road for animals in the big five. Lion, leopard, buffalo, rhino, and elephants. But we don't show rhino. As well as cheetah and wild dog are another two animals. So it's the magnificent seven that we will drive off the roads for, but the other animals we will not. And if you'd like to one, know any other questions or let us know who you are and where you're watching, if it is your first time, please do so. And it's quite simple. All you do is hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And if you are not a Twitterer, then you can send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we really do always love to know when you people are joining us on Safari. Of course, we'd love the regulars, but it's always a very exciting feeling knowing that somebody is joining in on their first live safari. Understandably, as I would, I find it, well, a lot of people find it hard to believe that it's actually happening live. So, it's quite nice to also just confirm to people by answering their questions that that is in fact the case. And like I said, I know for certain if I was to stumble upon this little safari experience, on the internet, I would have huge doubts to the fact that it's possible to be broadcasted live. So I'm on the same, same wavelength as all of you that do answer those, ask those questions. Well done, John, along with many others who got some great screenshots of that wildebeest. The girls in FC are applauding your photography. And well done to Brian for getting the camera there and such quick speed as well. Good. We're going to send you back to James. Linking. Right, everybody. Um, I think you can hear me. Andrew, can you hear me? You can hear me. Um, I'm just going to show you where the wall was. Is. It is here in the elephant's foot. And I will do the water. It happens anywhere near my mouth now, because uh, as Andrew said, it will result in jippo guts. And for us, with our slightly longer feet, or oh, there's lots of water here, feet, of course, uh, it's easier for us to walk here than it would have been for that uh, hapless water buck, uh, but it's still not that easy. And in this particular elephant. Interesting. Water under the dam is a treehouse dam. And I bet you didn't expect to be back with Brian and myself so soon. But again, emphasis on the fact that this is all happening live and there are some technical gremlins that jump out and make our lives a little bit tricky from time to time. But I'm sure it won't take long for James to get back into a better signal area. So we're not too far from the boundary, invisible boundary between Juma and Arethusa. It's only a road and only the humans know of the boundaries here. The animals have the free reign. But we are going to cross over onto Arethusa and I'm hoping that we manage to track down the Ikuhuma pride of four lioness, which are over there. The other lioness, I'm told, is still on the 
other side of uh, Juma. So Arethus is on the western side, Tortrude is on the eastern side, and one of the lioness from the Informa Pride is still with the Birmingham males. I'm told they were mating quite intensely a few days back, but that subsequently subsided. So they're not mating as readily as they were about four or five days ago when they first came into contact, but they're still hanging out. So who knows what exactly the story is there. It's very difficult to go on other stories and tales you hear along the Bush Telegraph because I found that that often leads to kind of misinformation and it's better just to make uh, assessments on animals and what they've been doing if in fact you have seen them yourself so not too sure exactly what's been going on but that's what we've heard just pulled over there to check for tracks it was just some buffalo tracks being followed it looks like by a couple of hyena uh, I was thinking that there may have been some lion on the trail of those buffalo, which would have been great. Hello to Kevin, who would like to know if Karula will do any hunting within the first three or four days of giving birth. And yes, there's a strong, very strong chance that she will. Um, but again, it'll vary in each different leopardess's uh, scenarios and of sequences of events that lead up to her giving birth. If she did give birth last night, and we cannot be 100% sure that she didn't give birth the night before last, and we simply didn't see any cubs there yesterday. Um, so that's the first speculation that, that I'm going to make, which makes further analyzing this a little bit tricky. But like I say, I mean, even though we were there for a long time yesterday and didn't see any cubs, we didn't crawl into that little den and poke our head in and make sure for certain. So maybe she didn't uh, give birth to the cubs last night. That's the first thing I'm going to say. Then the second thing is when she arrived at that den yesterday morning, she was full belly, which means that maybe she's not going to be hugely pressed to make a kill in the next three or four days. Whereas you can imagine a leopard who would, would have been very hungry at the point of giving birth, then she would certainly need to hunt within days of giving birth. And yeah, that just makes you understand that there's so many variables that it's... It's so difficult to answer those questions conclusively and concisely because nobody can be sure. I think Michael as well. Um, you interested to know if there's any chance we could set up a cub cam with live footage from the den. Trust me, I've thought of this as well. And it would be wonderful if it was possible, but it's going to be something that's very tricky to do. A couple of reasons why. Obviously, you're going to need to put in quite a lot of infrastructure, maybe a solar panel. Um, Know, some electrical stuff, the camera itself, and even if it was a quick and easy installation, which it wouldn't be, even if Karula was away from the den and you had a vehicle with her and you knew she was nowhere near those cubs, you would have to get in and very close to that den, which probably wouldn't have any effect on the cubs, I don't think. But when Karula got back to that den and smelt all this human activity around the entrance to it, I don't think that would be... Uh, you know, a good move on our behalf. So, as wonderful as it would be to gain insights into a leopard's den, it, I don't think it would be the right move to, to do, uh, because like I said, she's going to arrive back there and smell that we've been right at the entrance to her den, and I'd prefer her not to have any thoughts, be it good or bad, about why we may have been snooping around there. Not worth taking the chance. Then, on top of that, and probably more importantly, leopards will move their dens, sometimes every three or four days, um, especially in the early stages of giving birth. Um, and 
obviously it differs from leopardess to leopardess and from den to den and from one set of cubs to another but she could very well in a short space of time move those cubs and then we're going to be left having to cross the same bridge as before having to get up close to the, the, the cubs while she's not away it's just too much too much to gamble and as wonderful as it would be to gain insight into that at this stage I, I don't think it's it's a feasible option but with the way technology is going that could well change so maybe in the future we could be able to rig something up with a lot more ease with a zoom camera that doesn't have to be too close to the den shore but for now I don't think it's going to happen Tammy, and you would like to know the likelihood of humans intervening uh, to help these cubs in any way because they are endangered and because they've got an 80% mortality rate with the cubs. And Tammy, as far as I'm aware, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but I don't think leopards are endangered. Um, that's the first thing. I know a lot of the time people will uh, intervene or, or will be happy to intervene. Sorry, let me just get my radio out of the way. We'll be happy to intervene if uh, the animals at risk are endangered, but leopards aren't as far as I'm aware. And on top of that, Tammy, I, I hear you, but, but what good is it going to be rescuing a leopard cub unless you can be certain that it's going to continue growing up in the wild. I think there's a le enough leopards in captivity to justify no more going that direction. And for me, basically, if a uh, leopard cannot survive in the wild and there's already a stockpile of leopards in, in, in captivity, I don't think we're going to be doing any animals any favors by trying to help them. Because for me, and again, this is just my opinion, unless an animal is growing and living and succeeding in its natural habitats in a wild open space, um, I don't really see the point in having too many more in captive environments. I mean, that's that goes against everything that we do. We, we want animals to exist in the wild, and that's where they belong, and that's where they can be leopards, where they hunt for themselves, and they do leopard things. As soon as we take them out of uh, the wild, then to me, you know, we might as well just have domestic cats. But again, that is just me, and I don't think by intervening in any way necessarily it is going to help. The fact that there's an 80% mortality rate has been happening since the beginning of time, since leopards were first walking the planet. So by going and trying to help little cubs now, um, simply because of that high mortality rate, I don't think is, is the solution. Again, you know, Tammy, there's so many variables and Unless uh, a question like that is posed with very strict, uh, you know, circumstances, like if the leopard cubs were being eaten by a python, would you intervene? Or if the leopard cubs were found being smuggled out of Johannesburg International Airport, would you intervene? Because I'm not too. It's, it's difficult to gain insights into what you may thinking may be happening to these animals, but the finer details in these kind of questions is critical with regards to how you can answer them. Okay, well, James has not only found some signal, but he's also found some stripes. See you later. <laughs> zebra, 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 everybody. We have come down the cheetah cut line where there is a nice clearing and there are some zebra grazing in the sun. 
So, nice there to see, I suppose. Ooh, you probably can't hear me, hang on. There we go. You can hear my deep voice now. Uh, the microphone was on my knee as opposed to on my shirt. Um, we were just chatting about heat exhaustion and Mr. Moustache was was asking about Iceland, or not asking about Iceland, he's in Iceland, probably freezing, um, and you were asking about heat exhaustion in the, in the animals, and here the zebra are, of course, standing in the full sun. I mean, it is starting to cool down a bit, so I suppose the crepuscular nature of most of these animals, uh, that means the animals active at dawn and dusk, uh, their crepuscular nature uh, will allow them to move around about now. And I think you would have found that, or you will find that they've just probably come out of the deep shade where they will have spent most of the heat of the day. There's also, of course, a lot of, nobody really knows for sure why zebra have stripes and it's, you know, a lot of human beings with a bit too much time on their hands and not knowing what to spend their money on have done all sorts of research projects as to why zebras should have stripes. And one of the thoughts is that it could be to uh, get rid of heat. Now, <clears throat> I personally think that this belongs in the same uh, realm of sanity as a Scientology, but the, the thought is that the, the black stripes and the white stripes, of course, attract and reflect heat at different rates, and that sets up some kind of convection cu current around the zebra, which apparently could maybe perhaps sort of a little bit reduce the heat that the zebra experiences. Um, I think that's nonsense. I think it's simply to do with the fact that they uh, were certainly not camouflaged, but it helps them to hide helps them to dazzle their predators as they run through the woodland. Their predators, of course, being colorblind. Anyway, it's a very still afternoon. There's a little breeze coming out of the southeast, as I said, and that's where the weather normally comes from if it isn't a storm, and so that would be the prevailing breeze around here. And the zebra, oh, they look very calm and collected, I don't think, they, they, they'll like this time of the day, you know, because the predators are not moving around at the moment, and they'll know that, and so this is a good time for them to eat and do what they have to do before the serious business of the night starts, and they need to be super aware and on top of their game. All right, let us pop down this cut line. nice question from Wade. And Wade, you're a new viewer. Um, I always like to do this uh, particular way of driving down this cut line. I find it um, well, liberating, really, and it's a nice straight road. If you do hear a, a, a yell, it's because I've driven Andrew through a branch and he's fallen off the car. But as long as he locks off the camera, we won't worry about him. He'll catch up with us later. Um, Wade, you want to know if these are only done, these live safaris are only done, oh, there's a little foal. Look at that, look. That's very sweet. Wait, I'll get back to your question now. I'm just gonna sneak forward. Beautiful little foal. I just, I'm always amazed when you see that thing. I don't think that can be more than, well, probably maybe a month old, uh, but not more than that. And of course, a cat or a dog aged a month is still almost completely immobile. They can move a little bit, but they're still so vulnerable. Whereas a month old herbivore, like a zebra or an impala or a kudu, uh, is mobile, fast, and almost impossible to catch. So while, let's just sit and look at this zebra for a while and wait, I'll ask, I'll answer your question. You want to know if this happens only during the summer months or if it will happen also during the winter. Uh, Wade, actually, this part of the world is uh, probably 
uh, most pleasant during the winter months. It really doesn't get very cold here at all. Four degrees or so is the coldest we had this year, uh, and that's not four degrees Fahrenheit, that's four degrees centigrade, which in Fahrenheit is probably about 45, I would guess, somewhere around there. So that's not cold at all. And then the days get up to about 27 or 23 degrees, 24 degrees, um, certainly very seldom less than 20 degrees Celsius. And that's, you know, that's very comfortably in the 60s in Fahrenheit. So this, it's a great time to come and visit if you ever come out here. Winter, they say, is South Africa's or the Lowfeld's best kept secret because people tend to come out in summer to avoid their own winter and then they cook quietly here while they're here and sometimes not so quietly. Uh, but the winter is a brilliant time to be out here. And so, yes, we will be carrying on these safaris throughout the year. Um, I, I'm probably in the same format that they are now. We're talking about doing various different kinds of formats, possibly some nighttime stuff, um, possibly some hunting stuff. Um, but in essence, we will be doing at least two live shows a day for the foreseeable future winter included and probably especially in the winter the other reason the winter is so good wade um is that the, the, you know there's there's a lot less vegetation around and so the animals are a lot easier to see and uh, by hunting stuff what i mean is that at night time um you know we're looking into using some nighttime cameras and that will allow us greater freedom to follow cats on the hunt especially lion prides on the hunt which at the moment you see um the cameras that we have are very but they're fantastic in the daylight, but at night time, um, unless you've got a big light and, and you've diffused it carefully and you, you know, you really, you, you've got to be really good with the, with the light and you've got a really good lighting in order to A, not disturb the animals and B, light it up enough for the cameras. And so we're going to be doing some experiments with cameras that are better at night time and that will then allow us to follow lion prides on the hunt. Thank you, Wade. Nice question. Right, a question from Miss Lobo Bob. Um, Miss Lobo Bob, uh, you want to know about the insect theory of zebra. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I can't remember it. I definitely read about it, um, but I don't remember it entirely. Um, I think it's got something to do with the fact that, uh, oh, look at that, beautiful bird as I avoid answering Miss Lobo Bob's question. I'll get back to you, Miss Lobo Bob. I think that's a little Wahlberg's eagle. There he is. Oh, look at that. Can you see him, Andrew? There he is. Beautiful. I think that is... It's a Wahlberg's eagle. Let me just train my powerful binoculars on him. Oh, he's, he's flitting about the place. You still see him, Andrew? Ah, shall I speak forward? I think I've got a bit of view here. There we go. Don't fly, bird. Don't fly, don't fly, don't fly. Try and get in as tight as you can on his head. Is that is a wee full, full in? Fully in. What we want to look for here, people, is... I mean, the only other thing it could really be is a step eagle. But it looks much too small to me. And you tell by the extension of the sear, which is basically the lips of the bird, beyond the midpoint of the eye. Uh, that it, uh, you know, it doesn't do that on that bird, but the, uh, what's making me slightly doubt my original diagnosis of a Wahlberg's eagle is the fact that it doesn't have that little crest at the back of the head. Oh, did you see the white there? I wonder if this isn't a little booted eagle. Right, I'm just going to get the book out. Let's see if we can't diagnose him. Oh, that's a... Very angry bird coming to chase him away. Doesn't like the presence of that predator there. 
I'll just quickly get out the brown eagles. They can be a little bit confusing, especially this time of year. Is he gone? Forward to back. There we go. Forward. You can see him. Oh, yes. Just watch him there. Oh, beautiful. Color underneath. Yeah, I'm, I think that's just a... And Steffi reckons a lesser spotted. And it would certainly be the first lesser spotted that I'd seen this year. Um, no, it's... No, I'll, I'll tell you why it's not lesser spotted. You see, it's, see, it's paler underneath than it is... A, a paler behind on the wings than it is in front. And a lesser spotted is the opposite of that, as I look at my book. Yeah, I think it's just a, a Wolbies, I'm afraid. Well, just... Right, I'll show you what I mean once Andrew's finished doing some sterling camera work there. Andrew, move more smoothly. <laughs> it is extremely difficult to do what Andrew just did there, or is doing. We'll see it. Oh, there you can. Oh, the tail looks a little bit wide for it to be a Wahlberg's eagle. Mm. That's very interesting. Right. So, these are the sort of brown eagles that we get of round about that size. There's the booted. I don't think it was a booted eagle unless it had, uh, you know, it was a particularly dark morph of the booted eagle. And if you look down here, sorry, Andrew, if you can just go over to the left a little bit, there's the dark morph of the booted eagle. So they do get quite dark, but they are a bit more sort of scruffy on the top there. Um, then the other option was a lesser spotted eagle and the reason I don't think it was a lesser spotted eagle, if we go back down to the flight patterns here, Andrew, um, you can see that they are very black on the hind edge of the wing, both the immature and the adult. And that one was very clearly paler on the bottom, on the hind part of the wing. And the only one of these brown eagles that is paler on the hind part of the wing like that is a brown morph Wahlberg's eagle. The other option is a very dark morph tawny, um, but I don't think that that bird was big enough to be a, dar uh, you know, a, a tawny eagle, except that it didn't have that crest and it also didn't have um, the very thin, distinctive tail. So I... From the size, I'm going to go with my original instinct of Wahlberg's eagle. Anybody who wishes to disagree with me, uh, please feel free to send through your reasons. And, um, yes, I'd be very interested to know. Right. Let's go back to Scott. I think he's got some predators to show you. Well, we've got lucky. And even though they're asleep, they are lions. Three of them that you can see piled up. Oh, perfect. Yes, we're talking about you. I'm just going to get a hold of Sid quickly on the radio from Arethusa. He's joining us. He was also looking for these lions just before we found them. Sid, I've got your audio. We're not too far. Oh, thanks, guys. And... Sid actually suggested that we come and check out these roads. He was going to check other roads. I pulled over, saw some of their tracks, fresh tracks, and Brian spotted the line from where we saw those first tracks. Oh, there's a big yawn. And isn't this awesome, Matt? A bit of teamwork between the guides, plus their knowledge of what was going on with this pride this morning certainly helped us to find them. You can see they're panting quite heavily. That's because of 
the combination of factors, the heat, plus the fact that they are finishing off digesting the buffalo that they, I think, finished feeding on late last night. Now, I did mention earlier that we can expect to find four of them, and the other one is lying up. I just don't know if we're going to be able to get a gap from where we are here, but there are all four here. Well, very happy to hear that Michelle has allowed her geography class to be lucky enough to come to Africa on safari today. And Travis, you are asking if this is the same pride of lion that Sarah always talks about. Hello, Sarah and Travis. And yes, it certainly is. It's the Inkawuma pride. Like I said, there's four here. The other one lioness is away with the Birmingham male lions, who are their new boyfriends. And that's why we can only see four of them here. There's only actually three in this pile, and then off to the right, not too far away, there's another one lying down. Maybe this one that's getting up now is going to go and lie with the other lioness. But good that we're seeing a little bit of movement from them. Maybe they're getting a bit restless. Maybe they're getting thirsty. Maybe they want to have a drink. So she's heading over to the other one now. And I'm sure you can possibly just make out the other one that she lay in front of. Good, so comfortable lines. There's a cool breeze blowing and I'm guessing they're going to remain fairly comfortable for a short while, unless, of course, some more prey doesn't stumble upon them. And Kevin, you've just sent through a comment saying that every time you see these lion, they're full-bellied, and where are they getting all their food from? And it's a good question, Kevin. They've had a lucky streak over the last few weeks hunting buffalo, and that's all they've been feeding on that we've seen. So... A couple of reasons why I think they have been successful in their buffalo hunting recently. And the main reason is that they are picking on prey that are getting quite weak. It's a drought. The herbivores are not as strong as they typically would be at this time of the year. This is the time of plenty, or at least it's supposed to be, the time of plenty for the herbivores, but not so much. And because of that, it's causing them to be a little bit weaker than normal, a little bit slower than normal, and that's making for these lioness to have some very easy hunting opportunities. Well, let me reassess that. Not very easy, but easier than normal. And what we'll probably find is, is that this uh, pride of lion, along with many of the lions in this area, are going to start really focusing on taking down buffalo. If they work out that the buffalo are getting a little bit weak, a little bit easier to take down than they normally are, they're going to keep aiming for them because they're a perfect prey, prey size. For a pride of lion like this, there's quite a lot of hunger mouths to feed and a buffalo especially a medium-sized buffalo which is what they've been targeting is perfect once they've brought that down they're good to to feed on it for two or three days and then three or four days thereafter they're probably not going to need another meal so one kill provides them with kind of one week of good going it's a good point though kevin they have had a lucky streak and hopefully we too will be in luck and be able to film them taking down one of their hardest prey the Cape Buffalo. And it's actually the only animal that we've successfully been able to capture hunting, or at least the only pride of lion that we've been able to successfully capture hunting from start to finish with the actual takedown. And they caught a big buffalo with Brent sometime last year. And there was an incredible sighting was had. There was a decent sighting of lion taking down buffalo with Peter Pretorius in November 2014 with the Birmingham boys, and actually Brian was on camera during that hunt. It's been Brian's only hunt, so Brian's hoping to get lucky again. And I guess the catch with that is that we missed the initial kind of takedown. We saw the lions running after the buffalo, and then as Brian and Peter came around the corner, the buffalo was already down. What happened thereafter was really interesting, and the rest of the herd came in and tried to chase the lion off their fellow herd member, but unsuccessfully, and it was mainly the one biggest 
Birmingham male at that stage, and he stood out quite a lot back then. He was by far the biggest in terms of body and mane, and he stood his ground while the other four lions wrestled the young buffalo. James Angelo, you would like to know exactly how hot it is. And it's 36 degrees Celsius, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's an exceptionally hot afternoon here. Uh, go ahead. So I just need to be on the radio and control the movements of the vehicles in the sighting. Stations, just to confirm, uh, it's just myself here, Sid has moved out, and whoever's going to be making the way can control this, if you don't mind. Okay, well, I've just hopefully signed out of the responsibility of controlling the sighting, which can be a task in its own, and I don't want to divert my attention away from you guys onto a busy radio wave. So now the only thing we can hope for now is, and I'm guessing probably for the next hour, and always remember that the words I use, i.e. I am guessing, means that I'm not downright stipulating that this is what the lions will do. I'm guessing, though, that they're only going to be up in about an hour's time. And that's due to the heat. It's due to general behavior of lions in this area and just my experience over the years with them. Of course, we could be pleasantly surprised. And it was just the other day that I was pleasantly surprised by these same lions. As I said, it's time to leave. We're not going to get to see any action. They got up and started feeding on the buffalo. It's a good example of how we don't always get it right. But today, like I said, I'm not expecting great things. It's not to say that I think we should go. And by sitting here, we just increase our chances of getting lucky. We don't know what prey animals could stumble upon these lions now. And even though they are hot, and even though they are not extremely hungry, they will certainly try and take down whatever prey opportunities provide themselves to them. So that's what we need to hope for within the next hour. Thereafter, let's just hope that the lions get up and go for a drink. Red Dam is not too far from here, which is the closest little puddle of water. Deborah, the armchair traveler, all the way in New York. And I think, I can't shift very clearly on the radio at the moment, but I think you'd like to know an update on the Styx Pride. And, it's, oh, sorry, it's not the Styx Pride, it's the fifth member of this Pride. And um, she's across on Torchwood, so she is east of Juma. What I can do is, let me just get my map out quickly, and then I'll show you exactly what's going on. But I will update you on the Styx Pride as well while I'm at it, but I'm not going to be able to do that very easily with the map. Okay. So, I pulled up my little GPS here, and I can show you where we are now, which is this little blue dot. Okay. Now, to the north of us is a property called Sibambili, uh, where we cannot go anywhere green is not for wild earth, it's for other people to drive along. This is the Arethusa waterhole over there. We are on the boundary of Sibambili and Arethusa over here. The lions had their kill, these same lions had their kill 
somewhere just about there. The Buffalo Kill most recently, so they haven't moved too far away from it. And Red Dam, like I said, is just over there. So that's the closest little puddle of water to where they are. Okay, now the fifth member of this pride has gone the whole way through Juma and is a prop in a, on a property over here called Torchwood. So she is east of us at the moment. Um, the Styx Lioness are somewhere down over here on a property called Manamala. I'm fair, I think that's where they are. So on updates on our WhatsApp group, Sabi Sands Nyamazan, Nyamazan meaning animals and all the guides in the various parts of the 60,000 hectare park open to the Kruger National Park or keep in touch with one another with the various animals. This, to give you an idea, is probably about 2,000 hectares. So we, are, we have the ability to traverse 1 30th of the entirety of the Sabi Sands. Um, and that's why it's important that uh, all of us keep in touch with the various guides because nobody can traverse the whole of the Sabi Sands um, into, with their guests. That's why it's so useful to be able to share information amongst the guides in the different traverse areas so that we can keep tabs on animals that we all know. And Debbie, the fifth lioness is across on Torchwood on some kind of a honeymoon, you could say. She is with one, of, uh, or at least I think a couple of the Birmingham boys, maybe just one of them. And I'm told four or five days ago they were very passionate and lots of mating was happening. But more recently the, the mating has subsided a little bit. So interesting behavior there. As usually they mate for three to five days. And speaking of lions mating, Tammy would like to know if there have been any lion cubs around at the moment. And certainly not, Tammy. Um, no cubs to report that I know of. But I'm sure in the coming months we are going to get lucky because the Birmingham boys have settled down. They've kind of established themselves in this area. And they have been seen mating with various lioness from the various prides. Now, the tricky thing... Uh, straight after a takeover has happened is that lioness will mate with males in what is called a false estrus. So they'll do it simply to kind of help win the, the boys over, give them this false sense of manlyhood and macho-ness, and thereafter they may come into real season where they will actually be able to conceive. Um, so difficult to know whether a lioness is in false estrus or full-blown estrus, um, but what is typical is that once a marauding coalition of males has come through, wreaked havoc, killed lioness, killed cubs, after a few months, the natural progression is that the lioness that they have now become friends with will be the mothers of their cubs. So I'm hoping it's not going to be too long until that happens. Isabella, just four years old, and isn't it wonderful that people of all different ages, races, from all different continents around the world can all be on this safari vehicle together? Isabella, you've obviously been hearing Brian and I complaining about how hot it is today, and you're wondering if the lions will ever have to throw up because it's so hot. And not that I've ever seen, Isabella, and... I think in general, animals are a lot tougher than we are and will show signs of weakness a lot sooner than we do. So you'd probably find that Brian and myself would start stopping working as well before the lions did. And very happy that whilst explaining the whereabouts of the lioness within this pride, Michelle's geography class got a bit of an idea of how the GPS works and a bit of north, south, east, west. And what we'll be able to do, Michelle, a little bit later on or on the sunrise safaris is also help with teaching the class how to tell the direction from the sun. 
and even when we start spending more time out at night we'll be able to tell the direction just from the stars so those are going to be your future safari live geography lessons but we don't want to overcrowd your notebooks today <laughs> Well, you guys are in luck. You are going across to some antelope doing a dance-off. Now, everybody, I know that we are looking through a fence here. Uh, we're at Voyatella Camp. Um, but I just thought we should stop and have a look at these two nyala, which are in the throes, of course, of their little dressage dance. Now, yesterday, two, day, two days ago, Brian and I sat with the most astonishing sight, and I wonder if it wasn't these two Nyala, I don't think it was, but could have been, having a real physical battle. It was the first, second time I'd ever seen it, but it was the most astonishingly physical fight, and we never normally see it, because this is what the Nyala normally do. They sort of walk around each other with that ridge on the back of their, on their backs, extended, standing up. And this is their kind of, um, believe it or not, uh, aggression. I mean, that is ridiculous. Now, that Nyala that you can see with his back arched like that jumped over this fence uh, from a standing start and then proceeded to demonstrate uh, his, uh, well, I'm just not sure what you call that gait, a Nyala walk, I suppose. Isn't that amazing? just feel the breeze starting to come up now. And these two are not just walking around. I mean, they are in, locked in a, well, I wouldn't describe it as mortal combat, but they're certainly locked in a, a very serious um, conversation with each other about who's got rights to what exactly. It is the most bizarre thing. And how this escalates into what was one of the most vicious fights I've ever seen out here, I'm just not sure. And I wonder, you know, if they haven't evolved this ability to kind of sort out their differences in this totally non-violent way because they are able to inflict such incredible damage on each other. And so as a way of sort of reducing conflict and making sure that any aggression doesn't escalate to the point of actual violence, maybe that's why they've evolved this um, kind of ability to sort out their differences with a silly looking dance. Well, the other one, while well, that one you're looking at there is a being, well, I mean, it is quite funny. The other one has decided he's going to have an eat. He's going to have something to eat before he does his next round. And interestingly, he's grazing. He's eating grass, which, of course, is unusual for a Nyala. They are predominantly browsers, of course. Andrew, how's our battery? Mm, we're doing OK. OK. So we've just got a small battery problem here, but we seem to be OK for now. Oh, fight's over. He's just realised he's not being watched. No one cares. So now he's embarrassed, so he's going to have a little scratch. And look at all that fur. I mean, they, I imagine they must get pretty hot. And that's it. Isn't that amazing? Oh, dear. I've unplugged myself. Sorry, Kirsten.
There we go. I'm back in. <laughs> and Iggy, as you say, um, you say that the, um, <laughs> the fence has proved itself by keeping animals out. Uh, yes, it's, it's largely here, um, not so much to keep things like Nyala out, which of course it's absolutely hopeless of doing. It's mainly to keep those buffalo out, because at night, of course, when you walk through a camp like this, uh, buffalo will often come and find a dark place to lie, and you don't want to surprise a buffalo at night. Um, that's when they can be dangerous, because they can be easily surprised at night time. So it keeps them out, it'll keep that hippo out of the camp. You definitely don't want to come across him at night, and it will also keep I mean, I know Karula spends a lot of time in this camp, but it would probably keep most lions out. And if they wanted to go over it, they probably could, but you'll find that they wouldn't necessarily do that unless there was a really good reason to go inside. All right, that was the Nyalas. Just hearing some guinea fowl alarm calling, but I don't see that they're alarm calling at anything specifically. All right, we're gonna go and change the camera now um, because this battery is going to die. And so let's hand you back to Scott and the lions and I will see you on the end of another lens. Well, isn't this one of the cuter poses you've seen? Africa's most well-known big cat, the lion, resting in. Absolutely awesome. And we've repositioned the vehicle slightly, so we saw this little opportunity and couldn't resist to try and show it to you, and it's worked out quite well. The other two, just to give you an idea of where the rest of the animals are in relation to these two now. These are the two that we couldn't see as well earlier. The other two are off to the left. You can see one behind that tangle of branches and the other one slightly further off to the left. And initially, we were actually parked way off to the left, kind of below a knobthorn tree over there. So that's where we were parked, looking in on them. And now we've moved slightly further south and west of where we were. That was for Michelle's geography class. But obviously, it's very difficult for you to work out the directions that we're moving in from where you guys are sitting in your classroom. But if any of you are wanting to become field guides or game rangers one day, directions are a very important thing to know. So I'd suggest you start learning very quickly, and then you won't have to worry about that when you get out here. Hi there, Dawn. Who's in Chicago. And Dawn's interested to know if I remember any prides that move through the southern Sabi sands that are going to be on a specific property called Kirkman's. Um, Dawn, sadly, I worked in the southern Sabi sands at the start of my guiding career, which was, I always forget the dates, I think it was 2008 was when I started guiding uh, in the southern Sabi sands. And we didn't go as far as Kirkman's, uh, so not too sure and also obviously the pride dynamics has changed but I'm guessing there, there's still the southern pride I think that moves around that you'll probably see at Kirkman's but uh, sadly Dawn I, I don't know enough about that area now and certainly it's too far from where we are to have any kind of overlap of lines that we see here moving that far south so I can't give you too much info but there will be lions there, and there certainly will be leopards and all the other animals. And all it does is, all it depends on is your luck over the few days that you're staying there as to how much quality of sightings you get. But what I can assure you is that the Sabi Sands is one place where you can be assured to see great game viewing. And it's just a matter of how lucky you get out here, basically. Like I was saying, Dawn, I started my career in that general area. I wasn't as far south and east as Kirkman's. I was further, further west. 
So I boarded the western section of the Saabi Sands, kind of squeezed between the southern and western sections. And I left there probably halfway through 2011, and then went and spent a couple of years in East Africa, a bit of time in and around other places between then. And here I am now. And joined here back into the Saabi Sands from the end of 2014. And since I've been back, I haven't been back to visit the south. I've still got friends working at that same camp. But sadly, the traversing regulations are very, very strict in the Saabi Sands, and it's not easy to just drive through from the south to the north to visit your friends. But that is the reality and a result of the huge amount of poaching that happens in Africa. So that is a reality that we don't talk about too much, but... It is happening, and there are animals under threat out here. Ah, Pamela, you have asked a good question, and the rest of your geography class should take note. You have thought about the rain patterns of Africa and of South Africa and is wondering whether or not the weather conditions we get here are going to be the same throughout all the South African countries or is it going to vary from place to place? And that's a wonderful question. And it is going to vary quite greatly from place to place, even in South Africa, Pamela. The majority of our country has got summer rainfall, but the Cape area, so I'd say maybe uh, a fifth or a sixth of our country, does receive winter rain, and it's called the Mediterranean climate, where they get winter rainfall and a dry summer. So we don't have that Mediterranean climate up here, further north, but it's an example of even in the same country how weather conditions will vary. And I know that up in East Africa, up in Kenya and Tanzania, there too they've got a short rains and a long rains, and it falls over kind of different periods of time to where we get our rainfall here. So it does vary in the different parts of Africa that you go to. And therefore, it's a very important thing to know when planning your safari, depending on what you want to do and what you want to see. Rainfall obviously has a big impact on the safari experience. So it's good to know when the rain is going to be falling wherever you are going. As we sit quietly for a while, the bush is still very silent. And I'm hoping that it does come alive a little bit later on as the evening cools down. It usually does. But take notes of how quiet it is, other than a little bit of a breeze, but you may hear blowing gently over the camera. The animals are all on the go slow. Not just these lion, even the birds aren't even singing. Or well, not as much as they will be later, I hope. Hello to Iggy. And you would like to know how many official guiding schools there are here in South Africa. And I'm not too sure. There, there's many different uh, uh, schools that you can go to or, or, or training uh, people that you, you can go and do a one-month course or a six-month course or a one-year course. There, there's many different ones, obviously some with, 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 uh, that are well-reputed and well-known and other smaller ones that are, are possibly less well-known. And let me emphasize that by well-known, I don't necessarily mean better. It's simply 
you know, people are aware of them. And often maybe the small, smaller training programs could sometimes be the better ones, maybe more intimate, one trainer, fewer students. But there are many, many different ways to go about getting your guiding qualifications here in South Africa. Um, you don't actually have to do it through a, a, a training uh, course or, or, or any certain school, you can apply to write the exams and do all the training yourself from uh, the South African standard is the FAGASA system, the Field Guides of Association of South Africa. And what that means is that, that they've got set exams that you need to complete in order to be able to go to an area and guide. Obviously, certain qualifications require practical training out in the field, especially to get your trails guide, which is your walking qualification, that you will need to do under certain mentorship and under certain professional guidance. You can't just do that on your own because there'll be nobody keeping track of how many encounters you've had with elephant, with lion, with all the different dangerous animals. Um, but like I said, there's no shortage of different training facilities and there are many different ways you can go about it. You can train at a, be trained up at a camp that, that employs you, that helps you to get the qualifications and mentorship that you need from the current guides that they have in their system. Or you could go to literally like a school where everybody starts on the same day and you do a one-year course and thereafter that uh, training provider will often try and place you at various lodges where they've built up connections uh, and contacts and good relationships over the years. So, so many different ways to go about it. The most important thing to remember, Iggy, is that it's very easy. And if it wasn't, I wouldn't be sitting here. So it's not a difficult thing to do. And uh, often it's as little as six months training that you need in order to just sit behind a vehicle and start your guiding career. And then you can add on the next qualifications, the trails guide, the specialist uh, qualifications as you go along, depending on how qualified you, will, you would like to be. Let us know when you're coming out, Iggy. to Wade in Arkansas who would like to know how do we get into our areas of traverse if the traversing rules are so strict through, uh, within the reserve and it's a good qu question Wade and it sounds like you could be a new viewer so firstly welcome and thank you for sending your question through Wade basically how it works is that there are three entrance gates into the Sabi Sands uh, two are on the southern edge and one is on the northern edge. So if you work in the southern Sabi Sands, you have to enter through the southern gates. And if you work in the northern Sabi Sands, you have to enter through the northern gates. And to get from Gowrie Gate, which is the northern gate that we enter through, all the way around to either Newington Gate or Shaw's Gate, which are the two, ga two gates in the south, will probably take about two hours. <laughs> Whereas to drive from Juma to where my friends are in the south would probably take me 20 minutes. So <laughs> that's the reason why it's a little bit tricky and it's quite a, a long journey. It's not, it, it's not a hop and a skip to get into the other gates. And a lot of the guests, Wade, will actually fly into the Sabi Sands and a lot of the camps have got their own airstrips tarmac airstrips that they guess fly straight into and then it's a three minute drive to the camp so you find most of the the lodges in the the Sabi Sands cater for minimal discomfort and maximum luxury for their guests or obviously varying degrees and depending on where you go Bailey, also in Michelle's geography class, you would like to know if I ever use a compass. And no, Bailey, I, I haven't used a compass, but that's because I was lucky enough to be taught how to use the sun and the stars, which is easier than carrying a compass around. Of course, this is until, Bailey, the weather turns and it becomes cloudy. Because when it's cloudy and you cannot see the sun, as well as the stars, then it becomes very difficult and you can get lost. So I've had a few tricky moments, but I have actually never carried a compass. It probably would be a clever thing to have in case of an emergency. And I guess if your GPS breaks 
and the clouds come over so you can't see the sun or the stars a compass is a very very useful thing to have so maybe i should buy one bailey um, but uh, up till now i haven't been using one and haven't got too drastically stuck yet or lost you're only temporarily unsure of your position some interesting info that Stefan has kindly provided us with. Thank you, Steph. He's sitting in the final control. And apparently there are 33 official guiding schools in South Africa. So there we go, Iggy. You must just tell us which one you're going to decide to go to now. And what you'll find is after having tuned into our safaris, you're probably going to be far, far ahead of the other students on the course, or at least I'd like to think so. And if there are any little bits and pieces that you're worried about or not sure about, please let us know because we'd love to assist you in any way possible in getting you to become a fully fledged guide, if that is in fact what you want. Come on, lions, or come on, buffalo, to the lions. I love it when they sleep on their back with their paws in the air. Sometimes they'll even try and use the surrounding branches of trees to kind of splay their body open. The one on the right could do with one of those now because its leg keeps falling back down towards it. It needs a branch there. Oh, and back. And one more time, slowly back down. There we go. And back. No? Okay. Just going to get on the radio quickly and try and work out why nobody's coming to join us with these lines. Some people were expressing interest earlier. Are oh, any stations interested in the Kohumas? Okay, copy that. Keep coming, it's just myself here. Yeah? We're just south of the road, you'll, you'll get our visual easily. Oh, go ahead. And the radio is a little bit crackly over here, which makes everyone's lives quite tricky. But we'll work it out eventually. Last station, go again. Uh, Tristan, he said you must give him a call after drive, and I want to know where are you now? I'm on uh, Jololo Junction, uh, Katla. I'm on Southern Fork, south of uh, Sibambili, Katlan. I think I've got one vehicle audio, I'm not sure who that is, and visual. We're directly west of you. Okay. Now, even though we're in a lion sighting, strange things happen, and occasionally you get very lucky here in Africa and some other strange beast pops onto the scene and that's just what we've been hoping for today look at this is that a leopard cub i think it is can you believe it probably best for it to get out of here before these lions catch its wind but that looks like karula's cub popped in for a visit taking chances already but we don't mind that we are quite happy to have a bold leopard cub running around and who knows what they have to in that little den at the moment. Of course, we all would love to know. But I think it's definitely the right decision that we give her some space. We 
keep ourselves away from that sightseeing until it makes sense for us to actually be there and enjoying the new additions. Who knows how many there are? Only one confirmed sight, confirmed sighting of one from this morning with Prince. But once they get a little bit bigger in the next week, maybe two, then we can start probably spending more and more time with them, maybe even sooner than that, depending. But we're just going to ease into things. And in the meantime, we can let our imaginations run wild. And you know, just imagine Karula in that little den. We know very well what it looks like. And you can imagine what a tiny little fur ball of leopard looks like. So just let the imagination run wild and I guess be happy with the thought that the prospects of some incredible leopard cub viewing awaits us. Finally, after a year of no leopard cubs, we finally have hope that we are going to have some luck, which I'm certainly excited about. So just to keep you guys updated, it sounds like poor old James and Andrew are having a gremlin attack on rust buckets, their vehicle, and are having trouble getting the camera or whatever they're trying to get fixed, fixed. So that's why you're not hopping across back to them for an update. As soon as we get any further updates on them, we will let you know. Gracie, aged eight, you remarked that it's so cute the way these lions have been snuggling with one another. And it really is. I mean, it's surprising how animals that can be so fierce when they need to be can also be so loving. And you're wondering if they're missing Junior. I would love to know, Gracie. I'm not convinced that they are. But maybe they are. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they do miss him. Or maybe they just understand that it was time for him to carry on and maybe they're happy for him. Maybe they are happy for him to move off and become a big lion as he was always going to do. He was never going to stay with them forever and maybe they knew that. So maybe that made it easier for him or for them, for all of them when, when he left. Yeah, my mother. What they will miss though is the fact that he was big and strong and good for hunting. Last station, if you just head along Southern Fork, you'll, you'll get up my visual from the road. My Southern Fork now. Okay, we'll head west, and then you'll get visual from the road. Question though, Gracie. Now we are sitting downwind of these lines, even though it's just a very slight breeze, and we're probably about 20 meters away. And Jeff is asking whether we can smell them or if they're smelly animals. And not really, they're not nearly as pungent as wild dog, which is the most pungent of the carnivores. And maybe if you're snuggling up with them, which is something I've never done, maybe then you could smell them and maybe they've got bad breath from chewing on buffalo. But they're not incredibly pungent, no, Jeff. So it's very seldom that you actually smell lions. Or at least my little nostrils don't. Brian, how do your nostrils work with lions? Today they smell okay. Okay, yeah. So Brian says today they smell All good. Right. Nothing to really smell there. Love my side. Go ahead, Ryan. Scott, Moray. Uh, uh. uh, right, I just want to find out uh, time-wise uh, how long you're going to be there. Um, I'm on first down by. Mono, make your way directly as soon as you get your arm make space. Are you sure? Yes, 100% sure. Okay, I'm on my way. 
Okay, so two vehicles have just arrived simultaneously, and a third is on the way. And it's very important that we maintain good relations with all the guides so that we make sure that we get snuck into sightings just like they're sneaking in now. So I've offered the third vehicle who's on a first standby to come and join us. And rather than taking up good parking spots now, I'll probably head off right away. Two stations with the Inkahumas lying up, Monet making his way as a third. Okay, so sorry about that abrupt departure, but like I said, it's important just to keep good, uh, good uh, relations with the guides, and there was only a good spot really for two vehicles to um, get a view from where we were parked, so I just thought rather than causing all the other vehicles to reposition a million times once we've left, that we make space for them now. Now what I plan to do is keep in the general area and Maybe head to Red Dam, maybe see, see some animals taking a drink there. And if not, maybe these vehicles will head off for their gin and tonics, for their sundowners, leaving these lines unattended. Maybe we'll be able to sneak back in. So that's the plan. And at least while they're sleeping, we can leave them. And maybe we'll get lucky when they come back. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Have fun. And you would like to know if we get any massive birds out here that can compete with the Andean condor, which has a massive wingspan. And I've heard varying reports. The marabou stork has got one of the largest wingspans, and I'm told by some uh, sources that it's bigger than a condor, by others that it's slightly smaller. But they're similar. I mean, they're both massive, massive birds, the marabou stork. Um, in terms of weight, the condor might be a little bit heavier than the marabou stork. I think you said 27 pounds. I mean, that's ginormous. Um, maybe the marabou's up in that kind of area, but not convinced. And it's not quite the same in terms of the, the type of bird. I mean, the condors are part of the raptor family, whereas the marabou storks are storks. Um, in terms of big raptors, though, we do have the martial eagle here with a wingspan of up to 260 centimeters. So a ginormous wingspan, but not nearly as heavy as the condor. That martial eagle will probably only weigh about 10 to 12 pounds, I'm guessing. to know you're watching and Jason was actually here just a few months ago everyone just as we were doing just before we did the big cat week for Nat Geo and Jason was one of the top journalists selected for the assignment to come out and check out what we do and Jason it's so awesome to hear that you're watching 
what Jason has just remarked is also awesome, and that is that when he was here, he got to see Karula, he got to meet Karula, and now, just a couple of months down the line, he's heard that she's got cubs, and he definitely, if they survive, crossing fingers, are going to be able to watch them grow up, and who knows, maybe you'll be able to come back and visit once they have grown up, Jason, that'll be a wonderful full circle of events and it's actually not uncommon for a lot of guests who come to the Sabi Sands to keep track of the animals that they come to and even though I don't agree with going back to the same place in Africa year in and year out because there's so many different places to go and see that is the benefits I guess of going back to the one place that you fall in love with because you do get to see those animals and how their cubs are coming along and all those progressions and we must all be grateful that we are in a situation where so many guides collectively help to keep track of all these animals, understand what they're doing, understand who they're mating with, even if we don't necessarily see. It's just so cool to know that somebody's keeping tabs of them, and then we can all pull that information together and get great insights into their lives. Jason, like I said, awesome to hear that you are joining us on the safari and make sure you let us know when you do that again. Can you believe this? One. Hold on, Brian. Two. Three. And four. Oh, just gonna get my radio off the way. How cool is this? And I saw a lot of hyena tracks here, but I really wasn't expecting that we were going to bump into them. So this is a good spot to be aware of because I'm guessing that these hyena might have a den maybe nearby. Who knows? Maybe it's because of that buffalo kill that was in this area that the Nkuhuma lioness finished off late last night. Look at the beautiful sunlight on them as they disappear. And you'll notice some of them were muddy and wet, and that's because they have been wallowing in a tiny little mud wallow just off the side of the road here. And they're one of the only carnivores here in Africa that readily wallows happily in the mud. Lion, leopard, cheetah, oh, a lie, wild dog will also immerse themselves in water. Nearly got caught out there. But the big cats don't, and I guess because hyena are more closely related to cats they should, than dogs, they should gain credit for this. This hyena is about to pop into a little clearing, so make sure you're ready to take some screenshots. There's going to be some beautiful light on it. Come on. The rest of the clan have all moved off in that same direction. Oh, she's turned around. Not wanting to provide you guys with that opportunity for a screenshot. Let's see if we can't reposition, maybe if we go forward a little bit. It'll be better. The little mud wallows just here where they were. There you can see. And let's hope that we get a little bit more rain to keep all these little wallows full of moisture. Apparently, there's a chance that they it could be some towards the end of the week. Oh, it's tricky. It just lay down there. It's in the center of your frame, but not easy to see. So let's carry on. So we've got lucky there's some hyena still playing around here. And there you can see the adult with that wet side and rump. How oh, awesome. Sorry, Ellen. You've been wondering why is it that other animals like Kudu and Inyala and a whole host of different animals do not swim? Do not immerse themselves in the water to keep cool. Have you just not been seeing it, or does it not actually happen? And it doesn't happen. And why? I'm not too sure exactly. I mean, the first thought that comes to mind is a lot of the prey animals will be concerned for crocodiles, which could occur in any little body of water. 
in the African wilderness, and that's an important lesson in itself. Wherever you may think it is safe to swim, it is not necessarily the case. And even if you've been driving up and down a road for 10 years every day and never seen a crocodile in a puddle, that's not to say that there will not be one there when you go for a swim. So be ready for that. Be ready for a crocodile to latch onto you if you are swimming in a body of water where crocodiles do have access to, even if the chances are slim. And that's possibly the uh, kind of mindset that a lot of the uh, animals uh, adapt or adopt rather, that water is not necessarily safe things in context, uh, it wasn't too long ago in the southern Sahabi Sands at a particular camp here where a big male lion was drinking out of one of the water holes and everyone was enjoying this magical scene until the crocodile came out Patam, and pulled a fully grown male lion under the water with no problems at all. So even the king of the jungle can get taught a lesson by the crocodiles. But that's not for me a, a, you know, a good enough reason to, to, as to why the kudu don't, uh, you know, mud wallow or the inyala, because the buffalo certainly do and they benefit from it. Um, and the kudu's coat is not hugely dissimilar to a buffalo's coat. So who knows what causes that? But the only real herbivores to wallow are the ones with shorter hair as a general rule or no real hair, rhinoceros, elephants, warthog, the grey animals with not much hair, and also the Cape buffalo. What else am I missing? Most of the other antelope and animals throughout Africa will not immerse themselves in water, even if it's not necessarily muddy. They don't really like it. Let's see if we can get this quickly, Brian. There goes one, but there is one left there. There were some woodland kingfishers that you may have heard. Chickadee, chickadee, chickadee. You bottom right there. And um, there we go. And what they do when they are letting off that call and why I tried to go for it, dropping that brine in the deep end, was they hold their beautiful turquoise wings up. And it creates quite a good display. I haven't been able to capture this display for you so far this summer and come winter these birds are not going to be here so the clock's ticking i'm not sure if any of the other presenters have caught them in full display i don't think they have what it's doing now though is hunting look at how it's bobbling its head from side to side trying to focus on something down there and if we're lucky we may see oh that's looking good i love the way they bobble their head like that to try and obviously fine-tune and calculate exactly how far away their prey is, what exactly it is. And their prey, interestingly enough, despite their name being a kingfisher, they are actually king insectors. They are not kingfishers. They do not eat fish, as do the majority of the kingfishers that we actually see here. They are not reliant on water unless it's for bathing in the evening and for drinking. They do all of their hunting out in the bushveld, like this one now. Come on! Now, very often people would like to see kills, and myself included, because it's not something... Oh! Well done, Brian! That was incredible. Brian's showing off now. Um, and even though it didn't make a kill, the film work and the videography there was, as Kirsty said, Brian just killed it. <laughs> no death required when Brian's on camera. <laughs> Good work, Brian. And I thought it was going to plunge down onto the earth and pick up a grasshopper, but it just kept going, which obviously kept making Brian's life difficult. But that was great. A great display. And you may have seen a flash of that electric turquoise blue as the wings were beating back and forth. Just trying to keep uh, 
ear on the cracky right here. Yeah, that's why I've turned it up. So apologies for that. But I just want to make sure I keep tabs on what's going on with those lines and other vehicle movements there. Tom in Dallas, thank you very much for doing a little bit more digging around for information on the Condor versus the Marabou Stork. And according to Wikipedia, the, the Marabou Stork is a little bit smaller, a foot less in wingspan. So thank you so much for that. And it's really wonderful that you can share this information with us. Now, I'm just going to jump out quickly and pull the kit. I guess you're also happy that Tom has done some research for us on the birds. What do you think of my radio, guys? Pretty fancy. Um, <laughs> speaking of birds, look at this feather. And I'm guessing it was a feather from a vulture. Possibly vultures that were sitting up. I don't know if you saw, looked up um, just a few moments ago and there, there's a knob thorn tree. It's gonna be close to impossible for Brian to show you, but there's a dead tree behind us where I'm guessing a lot of the vultures were perched and they, they were the vultures that were waiting for the buffalo uh, or the remains of the buffalo that the Nkuhuma lions had killed. And there's obviously a lot of feather ruffling over here, which caused them to lose a few of their feathers. Usually you find these little white down feathers in and around the kill for a carcass. So maybe it's that a hyena dragged a portion of the carcass into this area and they squabbled over a chair. The telltale signs, those little white down feathers of vultures squabbling over some food. Shame poor old James and Andrew, and I'm sure the tech guys are pulling their hair off, no doubt, trying to get the rust bucket back to life. But it is not looking hugely promising at this stage, I don't think. They are hard at work, so that's why you guys have been stuck with me. I just assumed it wasn't looking promising. It is actually looking promising, so... Forgive me for that pessimism. But, like I say, apparently it is looking good that they will get that other camera and vehicle up and running. To Aqua, if you are interested to know which animal outside of Africa I would like to see. And probably the top of the list would be a tiger. Cybengal, Cybengal, Siberian Bengal, Sumatran, any kind of tiger I will be happy with. But you do get various subspecies thereof, and some are quite a lot larger than the others. I don't know a huge deal about that, but like I say, any tiger in its natural habitat would be an incredible animal to see and spend time with. Uh, while we're on the topic, Aqua, if you don't mind, I will tell you more than just the one animal. Uh, second one, probably also high up on the list, is the jaguar, which you can see hunting caiman crocodiles in various parts of the Pantanal, I'm told. That would be another highlight for me. Polar bears would be cool, not only because they're awesome animals, but because of the habitat that you find them in. And no doubt, when searching for polar bears, you're going to be able to tick off a lot of other animals off your list. I guess the same goes for jaguar and, and tiger. They both occur in very cool wilderness areas. Yeah, 
Ah, Ben within Africa, another one. So we're breaking the rules now, but still on the topic of my wish list of animals not yet seen are some of the primates that occur in the central parts of Africa. The gorilla would be one, as well as well, the mountain gorilla and the lowland gorilla, I guess both thereof would be good, as well as a baboon-like animal called the gelada which live in massive troops, of up to 800 animals in the Ethiopian highlands. And you should see the hair that these geladas have. It looks like they each have their own hairstylist that preps them every day. Long, brown, flowing hair, blondy brown, and just the most remarkable condition that it's kept in. They also have the ability to kind of flap their lips open and with their massive fangs. It's a very interesting display that they can do. But Aqua, yeah, I mean, there are just so many places on this planet that I would love to check. Yellowstone National Park and the wolves that run around there. Bison would be a wonderful animal to see. So, like I say, keep spreading the word of Safari Live, and we in turn will be able to take you on Safari just about anywhere. All we need is more people to join in. That's the only thing holding us back at this stage. So if you'd like to see more animals, as I do, help us by telling your friends. So we've arrived at the Red Dam, a little puddle that I was hoping was going to provide us with some animals taking a drink. So, nothing to see at first glance. And I just got a question through wondering about the sable that we got a glimpse of a couple of weeks back on the Juma waterhole camera. Not a couple of weeks, probably a week or so ago. And no, we have not seen any further sign of that sable. So, not too sure where it's ended up. It only evidently gets seen on waterhole cameras, either the Encora, Encora waterhole camera or the Juma, which is where it's been seen, I think, on two occasions, or further north and west on the Juma waterhole camera. I actually haven't heard, this doesn't mean that it hasn't happened, that any guides have actually seen it in the flesh. So maybe it's a ghost, this big bull sable, but there have been no reports that I've heard of it being seen since that glimpse that was had on the Juma waterhole camp. Let's hope that changes because they are incredibly beautiful specimens, especially him at least, uh, on his own is, is a fine bull. Let's have a look at the sunset while we are parked here. And it's a wonderful stage of the evening. You can already hear now the birds are beginning to call a little bit more than they were when we were stuck at the, stuck with the lions. And let's just keep quiet for a minute or so and see what sounds we can hear. Just turning off the radio quickly. Franklin just took off in a bit of a rush. Choo, 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 choo. Who knows what gave it a fright. A few emerald spotted wood doves calling, woodlands kingfishers. I can hear a few flies buzzing around my head. I'm not sure if you can hear the flies. Bzzz. Absolutely marvelous. What a wonderful playground we are so fortunate to explore on a daily basis. And it's always great to have you guys along. What's also great is that we've got some good news, and that is that James and Andrew and the tech guys have cracked the code, solved the puzzle, and you're going back to them to get an update as to exactly what was going on.
Hello, everybody. Sorry about our prolonged absence from the safari this evening, uh, but Andrew had to, uh, well, basically relearn to use a camera. Uh, we've changed 7,000 settings. There are another 5,000 that we could change. There's a kudu. Andrew, do you think you could extend to filming that kudu? Let's give it a bash. Let's give it a bash. There we go. Brave, stout fellow. Yeah, well, let's try and level it a bit. Yeah, it would be nice. That's it. Well done. Right, now the zoom you will see is extremely fast. There it is zooming in at top speed. Now this camera, I'm being a bit rude about it, everybody, but it's actually brilliant in low light conditions, uh, which we aren't in yet. Um, but this is the kind of camera that we will be using to film the cats hunting in the night. Now, rather like its Nyala colleague earlier today, this kudu is grazing, which is unusual for a kudu. They are browsers by default. And the heat has dissipated, as I'm sure Scott has said, with the sun disappearing over the western horizon. We are very grateful for this. Right, well done, Andrew. It's your first, an first animal with the A7S. Yossi, you want to know how many antelope species there are in the area. Um, I, I'm going to list them for you and then you can count them. We've got Stirnbock and Diker, the two little ones. Then we've got the Tragelaphids, which are the Bushbuck, the Nyala and the Kudu. Then we have got the Waterbuck. Then we have got, I suppose, a Wildebeest you could count as an antelope. Then we've got Impala, of course. Um, Andrew, am I leaving anything out? I'm too busy trying to find this one. Oh, right. <laughs> OK. Um, I think it's about eight, Yossi. I may have left out one or two. I think that's about it. Sorry, Kirsten just said something in my ear. I think she's thought of one that I haven't said. Kirsten, say that again, slowly, with clarity. Oh, of course, and we had a sable the other day. And the sable would be an excellent one. So nine, nine species of antelope. Uh, and they, those, of course, those are the most beautiful antelope there. The sable, the part of the hippo tragi, which means horse-like antelope. And they do have a rather horse-like look to them. They're not vaguely related to horses. They are antelope. Thank you, Yossi, for that. We'll try and remember that we've seen nine species of antelope here. Then, of course, in the Greater Kruger National Park, there are lots more than that. I mean, you'll find Irland, you will find some red heart to beast, you'll find sesame sometimes, roan antelope. Uh, you may even find a Sunni. Uh, you might find a Sunni in some of the forested areas. Um, and I've said Irland. Yeah, so you'll find another five or six different antelope species. A Sharps Grey's book is another one, which we could possibly get here, but it's unlikely. Oh, and um, a reed buck. Reed buck you'd find sort of on the river. Ooh. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> him say no there and that's because there was a beautiful pale form Wahlberg's eagle flying overhead it's still flying overhead but to uh, persuade this to persuade this camera to film it in a manner that where you would actually recognize it. and look at it you have to film it it's, it's diving it's going to kill something 
or just land in the tree. There we go. It's in that blurry sort of green thing there that you can see in the middle of your screen. Now, <laughs> Gracie, aged eight, thank you very, very much for your kind compliment. You say that those Nyala weren't dancing nearly as well as Brent and I. Thank you very much. I agree with that completely. Brent and I are excellent Nyala dancers. Um, I'm very glad, however, Gracie, that Brent and I have never had a fight like the ones that were fighting the other day when they were bashing their heads together. Um, Brent and I will certainly smash our heads and we'd have a very bad headache if we have ever had a fight like that. Brent, of course, has a skull as thick as basically this large marula tree I'm going past, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't sort of just back my chances. Well done, Andrew, that was very fast. This new camera. See, you're getting the hang of it. You'll, you'll see me looking down to the left every so often, and I'm looking at the screen down here to see if I'm in focus. If I'm not, of course, um, I will just make a little black mark, and, um, you know, that'll just be a sort of something that Andrew will owe me. Angela, very good question. I know it is extremely confusing for those of you who are especially for the regular watchers. Um, you say, don't we have three vehicles? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, you want to know the jigger is up and running or down. Jigger is what Scott is on at the moment. Um, and you say, so you use the term, um, has a jigger bitten the dust? Not yet. I feel this is an imminent eventuality. Wendy at the moment is eating dust. They are trying desperately to perform a Lazarus-like job on her, trying to make her resurrect there in Hootsprate. Um, but, you know, these are old cars. These Land Rovers are now pushing 20. And, you know, uh, they've never been the most reliable at the best of times. So, yeah, I mean, they're pretty old, and we do have to tape them together, tie them together, uh, you know, apply bits and pieces of chewing gum here and there, some string, dental floss to put the to put the clutches back on, and that sort of thing. So yeah, we have to do a lot of work to keep them moving. Thankfully, we have we do have three at the moment, because of course, um, for most of the time we've only had two, and then we'd definitely be in some straits. Even our little Mahindra went down the other day, but it's back up and running. I think we're going to get a magnificent shot of the sun. Now, Andrew, the sun doesn't move very fast, so I'm hoping you might be able to focus on that. Will that be all right, do you think? Yes. Thank you, Heidi. This is the greatest compliment that you could ever pay me. You say that you have to, and I mean that, you have to time your coffee sips quite carefully. I'm assuming so that you don't spit your coffee onto your, onto your screen um, as Andrew and I drive around. Um, I'm very glad that you find us amusing every so often. We do do our best. Now, there is a magnificent sunset about to happen. Andrew, I'm going to get you into position. Woe betide, you make a mess of this one. You don't have to film the European roller that just flew off. Here we go. Oh, this is going to be too wonderful. Right. Oh, and there's a big vulture as well. Ah, there you go. Look at that, everybody. We'll eventually get an idea of it when Andrew gets his act together. That is spectacular. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. And look at that beautiful vulture in the... Well, no, don't worry about the vulture, Andrew. You just stick on the sun there. Baby steps. 
And it's enormous like that, of course, simply because there is, it looks like a lot of smoke there on the western horizon. And, you know, the, as I've said before, there's a lot of forestry in the mountains there that you can see. And I wonder if there isn't a fire in one of those forests. Very dry, as you know. And so unusually for this time of year, there will be fires around. Certainly it looks like that sort of red color is being caused by beautiful, or by smoke. What a stunning sunset that is. Ah, it is now time to exhale. Take a deep breath as the changing of the guard happens and appreciate the sounds of the African night that are about to assail our ears. What I can hear is dwarf mongoose alarm calling. And that, of course, is the sound that gives them their Shangan name, which is Matsigitsoch. It's an onomatopoeic name. Andrew, don't you like the word onomatopoeia? Mm-hmm. There we go. I got the vulture, James. You got the vulture. Well done. You missed it. I'm back on the sun. Now. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Andrew. I was just so astonished by the, the sunset. I was mesmerized. There is the sun sunk down below the Drakensberg Mountains. Now, everybody, what I would like you to do is take a deep breath in through your nose. Smell the dust, the subtle scent of a few of the herbs that were sort of driven over, wild aniseed, some sage, and then breathe out with your mouth and enjoy the peace of the African evening. I think it's just wonderful, just like that vulture's done. Right, there is the vulture. And they hang their wings out like that, apparently, um, to allow the feathers and the barb and the, um, the filaments of the feathers to realign themselves. Because, of course, when they fly, although they don't do a lot of flapping, the vultures, um, there is a certain amount of wear and tear that comes from hanging in the air all day long. And I think what you'll find is that vulture is just holding his wings out so that everything can realign itself. He will do some preening. I say he, it could easily be a she. Um, they will do some preening and just realign things so that when tomorrow comes and he takes to the air as the thermal start to rise off the ground, which in the current heat situation will probably be about 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, not quite, but it'll be pretty early on so that when he does take to the air, he will be able to fly those enormous distances, hundreds of kilometers sometimes, in just one day. Very nice, Andrew. I'm assuming you're intentionally making him a silhouette there, are you? No, it's just doing that by default. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, we'll carry on now. Thank you very much, Linda, in Massachusetts. Some kind compliments. Um, you say that it's the first time you've talked to us. You're a regular watcher, but the first time you've talked to us. Well, it's very lovely to hear from you, Linda. And just as Linda has done, everybody, um, when you do talk to us, and we do encourage you to, please don't ever feel like there's a question you can't ask or that you should know something or perhaps it's been asked before. It doesn't matter. So please do get hold of us and always tell us where you're from because it's always so nice to hear where in the world our viewers are from. And Linda, you also played a very kind compliment to the cameramen who do an amazing job. And while I malign Andrew on live internet, uh, I agree with you. They do do an astonishingly good job. I only, I, I realized that one day when we were a bit short, I just started here and they said, well, why don't you operate the camera? And I thought, well, I mean, how hard could it be? 
Um, well, everybody in the final control was seasick for a week afterwards, so I can only imagine how appalling the viewers must have felt. So yes, the cameramen do do a superb job. Now, Andrew, speaking of superb jobs, um, we have a European roller here. It is not, in fact, moving at the moment, so shouldn't present too much of a challenge. And we're just going to zoom in with great speed on this camera. There we go. That's it. European roller. Also silhouetted. silhouetted. You can't blow the ISO, can you? No. Let's just try something here. There we go. You can see maybe a little blue tinge. <laughs> no. Well, blue tinge of the European roller. And below them, some Impala. No, Andrew, now it's black. How about this? That's beautiful. Right. How about this game? That's, uh, that's, get, that's, that's ridiculous, Andrew. Yeah, no, that's too much. You should stop now. That's perfect. That's lovely. <laughs> There's some impala below that I'd really like to look at. There we go. Well done. And they're standing here. They'll come out into the open as the light starts to fade because it's easier for them to see the predators. Now, this, that kind of thing that Andrew's doing with this camera is why we've got it. Uh, most cameras Certainly the other, others that we use are not able to push what we call the ISO as much as that. I don't know what ISO stands for, do you, Andrew? I haven't got a clue. No clue. Let's sneak slowly forward. As slowly as the zoom is retracting. <laughs> we will, we'll get the hang of it, I promise. has uh, cleverly gone back towards the lions because they are, um, well, because they are likely to start moving around about now. So let's head back there and I'm going to keep on down this road. So, I know a girl a girl was hoping that we were going to get one more glimpse of the lions. So there we go, a girl a girl watching on YouTube. Not much has changed, other than the, the three guides that were here with the guests. They've left and are probably enjoying a drink somewhere. The lion are still fast asleep. And other than a little bit of movement to attack the pesky flies, of which you can see a couple on this one's head, I think, buzzing around the ears. They've had a few attacks on the flies, but other than that, Sleepy for now. And let's see if on cue they don't actually change change tune. That one at the back got up first and it was initially four flies. And I think its movement caused the other one to stir. But it is that stage of the evening where they will be slowly waking up, wondering where to head next where they'll maybe go to quench their thirst. There are quite a few puddles around this area that are filled up into the mud wallows, so they're not gonna have too much trouble. And let's hope that they decide to head either deeper into Arethusa or back onto Juma. So we can hopefully find them first thing tomorrow on the Sunrise Safari. on, get ready for the screenshots. Oh, beautiful. Didn't give you much warning there. But another one could come. So be ready for a second or third yawn. to Andre in Florida, who's interested to know if lion or leopard will ever give birth to cubs outside of their territory. And 
it would be highly unlikely that they would do this because both them and their cubs would be at risk of getting into a brawl with the rightful owner of that territory and that's why it's uncommon for that to happen and all of my time in the bush i've never seen or heard of that happening of course there are always exceptions in nature and nothing is ever hard fact or a certain rule but i think it's highly unlikely like i say for the risks involved for any mother to want to give birth outside of her territory what's caught her attention down there i don't know if it was a fly or another kind of insect she always seemed a little bit scared of it But even she, after showing a little bit of signs of waking up, is looking like she's dozing back to bed again. And it's no different to us waking up early in the morning. It takes sometimes a few attempts before we get up. And I'm guessing it's going to be the same for these girls tonight. I was hoping there was going to be some possible prey in the surrounding areas, but... We haven't seen anything when we looped around this block to give the guides some time to enjoy the sighting. And on our way back in, we were scanning, hoping that there was going to be something that would catch these lions' attention. But nothing yet. Hi there, Anna. And as we see these lions fighting off the flies every now and then, your question is pertinent because you would like to know if lions ever climb trees. And yes, there are certain lions in certain parts of Africa that have adapted and evolved to becoming tree climbers as part of an almost daily routine. And it's in areas of extreme heat as well as areas with extremely high parasite loads and fly loads and by being up in the trees where there's more of a breeze i guess it's harder for the flies to find the lions there's more of a breeze to keep them cool and blow the flies away from them and that's why they do sleep up in trees but those are the main two reasons to escape flies and heat and all lions have the capability of climbing none of them nearly as well as leopards even the ones that are tree climbers and are practiced and seasoned at doing that obviously it would have helped growing up in a pride of tree climbing lines you're going to be better at it than oh it's trying to help its friend there by attacking that one fly that keeps landing on the bottom look oh this is awesome <laughs> but i guess possibly there's reasons why it doesn't happen here in the sabi sands very often possibly the wrong trees the marula trees which are the trees the leopards love sleeping in aren't quite suitable for lion Whereas in the areas where you do find tree climbing lines, often the trees are quite easy to climb, very thick horizontal branches, and like I said, not tricky to climb. Oh, back to bed for you. Good question, though, and I've never actually seen tree climbing lines, but I know you get a few up in East Africa, in various parts of Kenya and Tanzania. And I'm forgetting where else you've seen. Possibly in Botswana, you get them occasionally in certain areas. But there are renowned areas where you will find tree climbing lions. There are actually a few in a reserve where I worked in southern Tanzania called the Katavi National Park. But it wasn't a very common occurrence to see them up in trees there. You can see this one has just had enough of these flies. And... I think they're winning the physical as well as the mental battle as this lion is getting agitated by them. As is this one. Good signs, and I guess we can thank the flies for helping get, get these lions out of bed a little bit earlier than they would have liked to be. And this one's going to come now possibly straight past the vehicle after a short toilet break, which I'm sure she's going to stop for any moment now. Just wants to change the scenery. But 
But don't worry, Lioness, I can assure you, despite your efforts to move away from the flies, they will continue to follow you. They're not only bothering the lions, they're also bothering Brian and myself. They're hundreds of these tiny little flies buzzing all around us. Hello to King Calification and certainly haven't heard your interesting name over the radio waves before so i'm guessing you're new to the safari experience and also the fact that you are wanting to know where exactly is this happening confirms that so welcome on board great to have you with us and we're basically in the northeastern corner of south africa close to the border of mozambique and zimbabwe and we're in a massive massive national park Transfrontier National Park called the Kruger National Park, which opens into Zimbabwe and Mozambique, and it is ginormous. It is 3.9 million hectares in total, and the area that we are in is called the Sabi Sands, which is privately owned but attached to the Greater Kruger National Park. So animals have got free flow here in a very wild and natural ecosystem, and it's great to have you with us, and we're definitely going to get to share more about Safari Live, what we do, and where we are in the coming drives with you. So we look forward to chatting. Ah, oh, good news. There's an unexpected addition to Juma that you are about to see, a late addition. It is a late addition here, late in the game drive, of course, and that is a young newborn impala. Most of them, of course, dropped during the first two weeks of, uh, sorry, first last two weeks of November. Now, it's not unexpected to find them every so often popping out in sort of early March, uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, yes, early March, um, because there is a secondary breeding season in September, and I wonder if this isn't um, sort of, it may have been a slightly early one this year, and perhaps this is the offspring of one of that secondary breeding season. And of course, this is what has given rise to the, uh, um, to the notion that impala are able to hold back their youngsters until conditions are favorable. And that is absolute um, horse dung. And it's because of the secondary, um, the secondary breeding season that they have that we find these late youngsters. Isn't that lovely? And it's for the females who don't fall pregnant in May during the traditional time when they would get pregnant in this area. All right, everybody, that's us. That's it from us. I'm sorry that it was a little bit disjointed. Um, we're going to hand you across to Scott for the last few minutes of the drive. The lions are on their way. Uh, well, I don't know where they are moving a little bit. Big thank you to Andrew for your sterling efforts on the six or seven cameras we used today. Uh, thank you to Kirsty, of course, in Final Control with Nikki. Let's go straight back across to Scott, and I will see you tomorrow morning at 05.30. Bye-bye. So awesome that there's a few more baby impala running around. And I think it's the second one from this kind of second carving period. We got a glimpse of one on a bushwalk the other day. And now James with this one. So good news. Also nice to see the lions have moved out into the open and that you got to see at least the last one flopping down into this spot. I think it is the flies that cause them to move a kind of fairly hopeless attempt to get rid of the flies because of course it's easy to fly just a few meters and land back directly onto the lines that you've been already pestering the whole afternoon. And who knows where they're going to head from here. At the moment they've headed ever so slightly in a westerly direction. Obviously it doesn't mean that they will continue in that direction but if they do it means we'll probably have to come across to Arethusa if we want to find them in the morning. But I'm sure between James and myself, it will be part of our plan to try and work out what these ladies get up to in the course of the night. And I always wonder when we leave them on evenings like this, what exactly they're going to get up to, where they're going to go. They are most active at night and most action happens then. That's why you can't help but wonder what is in store for them. 
and more impo importantly, what is in store for the animals that they come across. Hello, Deborah, armchair traveller, and you interested to know whether or not we will head out, be heading out any later in the afternoon going forward due to the heat? And no, Deborah, we, we won't. Um, we're just going to have to deal with the heat. Um, and the reason why, Deborah, is that the sun is actually setting earlier every evening. So basically the time will stay as it is until a point when it's setting, setting much earlier. Um, and we'll start actually heading out a little bit later so that we're only going to be going out any later than we are now and I guess if a change was going to be made it should have been made a couple of weeks back so we missed the opportunity to make the afternoon drives a little bit shorter oh sorry not shorter heading out a little bit later so like I said the only time changes will be probably in about a month or so's time when we may be heading out slightly later or slightly earlier, I apologize, in the afternoon. Okay, well, it is sadly time to say goodbye to everyone and it's been great fun. Of course, apologies for not getting as much of James and Andrew as you would have liked to, but at least they did manage to temporarily solve that problem with their camera and did get out for the end of the safari with you. Well done, Brian. Always good to be out with you. Thank you to Kirsty, who directed the show, as well as Nikki, who is lending her hand. To all the new viewers, to all the not old viewers, it's been another wonderful safari with all of you, and we are really looking forward to what the morning holds, so make sure to tune in for the Sunrise Safari. Take your last few seconds to look at the lions.